Greetings. My name is David Hauk. I'm the Vice President of Embedded Safety Critical here at Parasaw. It is my pleasure today to introduce Gurunath Ramaswamy from Qualcomm, who is the Director of Engineering at Qualcomm Automotive. I've had the pleasure of working with Guru for over three years now, and I can tell you that Guru brings both vast experience and focused passion for the topic today. He is a key to Qualcomm's success in accelerating the digital transformation in automotive software. More personally, he's an outstanding guy to work with. Parasoft is proud to have Guru and Qualcomm as a customer and the opportunity to support them facing the challenges presented in the sometimes turbulent world of automotive software testing. In today's session, Guru will provide an overview of Qualcomm Automotive, talk about what they're building and testing for compliance, how they have addressed the challenges along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, Guru Ramaswamy. Hey everyone, um, thanks Josh and thanks uh, Dave for the nice introduction. Okay, so today's uh, presentation will focus on uh, the, what Qualcomm did to achieve functional safety software compliance for its uh, system on chip uh, software, the SOC software that we have. And I will give a quick introduction to Qualcomm, uh, especially on the ADAS solutions that we have. We call it the Snapdragon Ride uh, solution. Uh, and after a quick introduction to the overall solution, we will uh, go deeper into the functional safety concepts. I will start with the functional safety concept and the focus would be mostly on the software side. So we would pretty much go into uh, every section of ISO 26262 to part six on what Qualcomm did to achieve the safety compliance and what are the challenges we faced on the, along the way. Uh, also, uh, the, we will focus on how Qualcomm and Parasoft work together. That's one of the focus, uh, main focus in this meeting. And how uh, we had a tool selection criteria and how Parasoft uh, fit the bill bill and how our interaction happened. Um, so feel free to stop me um, anytime for any questions. Uh, given that we have only 30 minutes, I kept things at a very high level uh, because, uh, you know, this could easily be a two or three hour presentation. So I just put a single slide which has a key points. And if you want to go any deeper into any of these slides, you know, um, you can stop me and ask questions or, uh, you know, if you want to also contact me offline, you know, you have all the details here. And I believe Josh will send those details later. Okay, so let me get started. So Qualcomm has the uh, the main ADA solution it has is called the Snapdragon Ride platform. Uh, you might have seen in the press we already have uh, multiple uh, customers and multiple wins recently with the Snapdragon Ride platform. But basically, this is how it looks. Uh, at the very bottom, we have the scalable SOCs. We have multiple SOCs which would cater to different uh, ADAS levels, the SAE levels for all the way from L1 to L4. And we have a complete software stack on our top. The first two things you see in the stack <laughs> is what Qualcomm provides. We have a operating system environment and what we call as the RIDE SDK, which has middleware tools and libraries. After that, we work with various partners or sometimes the OEMs take care of it themselves to have a complete driving stack. Recently, we have partnered with uh, Arriver. You know, we have we acquired Arriver to implement some of the driving stack, the drive policy and the front and surround vision thing. Uh, and we also have partnered with few others to provide a complete driving stack. Any questions? Uh, no questions at the moment, no. Um, for it to keep going, I'll mention it if there if any come in, Guru. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Now going a little bit deeper, uh, <coughs> sorry, a <coughs> little bit into detail uh, into the. So I'm trying to move around slides a bit here. Okay. So now we will, you know, take a look at the hardware we have at the bottom here. You know, the, the Snapdragon Ride SOCs. 
going a little bit into detail into an SOC, you can see that we have a pretty complex system on chip. We have various, oh, I'm sorry, wait, I'm not sure why it keeps moving. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, just give me a second. I'll, I'll keep it like this for a moment. Uh, we have uh, various subsystems within the SOC. We have uh, a hexagon neural processor, which does the neural network processing. We have separate what we call IP cores or uh, smaller um, pieces of uh, hardware within the SOC for display, safety, security, video processing, camera processing, GPU, and the CPU. So one of the challenges is, you know, for achieving safety compliance in both hardware and software is the SOC is not a simple ECU like thing. We have various hardware, various uh, CPUs within them, various operating systems, etc. Now, getting into the software part of it, we have an auto imaging system, which is basically supporting cameras. Uh, we have the camera processing, you know, and then just we have a whole neural network processing toolkit so that uh, uh, any neural network can be compiled and executed with accelerated hardware. We also have embedded vision and autonomous driving libraries and a whole suite of middleware and SOC infrastructure, which is uh, has the operating system and all the drivers for the various hardware. Et On top of that, we provide development platform and tools for our customers to be able to use our SDK. And Along with the ADA solution that we had, we have, you know, we are supplementing it with other things, support for sensors, support for maps, and then some very interesting new technologies for <coughs> car to cloud and vehicle to vehicle communication. So with this, you know, we believe Qualcomm has one of the most comprehensive ADAS development systems and are more importantly, a very flexible ADAS development system uh, based on the need of the customer and their stack, it right, can be uh, implemented in uh, any scalable way that they want. Okay. So this is a quick introduction to the Snapdragon Write solution. And I also wanted to quickly show where the Snapdragon Write SOC fits into the overall scheme of things. Uh, to keep it very simple, what we have is we have a set of sensors which the input of which comes into what we call the processing element. And the processing element produces an output, which is sent to the actuators, which control the vehicle. And from the functional safety point of view, we primarily look at three to four things. So we have what is called a safe input. So whenever any input comes to a Snapdragon, as we say, be it camera, radar, LiDAR, et cetera, we, the hardware and the software ensures that the input is correct and you know it has the required data integrity so we have a safe input interface modules as an example if there is a camera sensor connected we check for various things before we process it whether the frame is not frozen frame is not corrupted etc and then we also have a safe processing once we have a safe input we have various uh, hardware accelerators for neural networks computer vision, et cetera. And we do all that processing uh, with ACL compliance. And then once we do that, we also have a safe output module to communicate to the external VCOs. This is typically done via uh, Ethernet or sometimes PCIe. And we also have ensure safety in any communication that we send outside to VC. On top of that, we also have a safety monitoring and health management system. Uh, most of the OEMs typically have an external MCU which, with, with which we interact to ensure that there is a monitoring of the SOC. This is typically like clock voltage monitoring, temperature monitoring, and a few other health monitoring. So this is where, this is how the Snapdragon SOC fits into an overall ADA system. Okay, now that we have an overall idea of the Snapdragon write hardware and software. Let us go a little bit into detail into the functional safety part of it. 
So both of our hardware and our software is developed as a CIOC, uh, safety element out of context. Uh, so typically for a single version of the hardware, we have multiple software products based on different operating systems and different customers, etc. And all of them are developed as a CIOC. Uh, primarily developed to meet ACLB, um, to be more specific, ACLB of D safety goals. And on the software side, we call it the Snapdragon platform BSP software. It's also developed as a software CIOC, which will, you know, of course, work only on the Snapdragon SOC hardware. So this is a pretty you know, interesting challenge. We have multiple software components developed for ACLB or ACLD components. So we have around 50 components and we have around five operating systems all on different processors and they all need to talk to each other and but they also not need to talk to higher level applications. And to meet this goal, you know, we work with various teams within Qualcomm to achieve this, but also, you know, based on need, we pre-integrate various third-party software. So I hope this gives you a scale of the complexity that uh, we have to deal with. Pretty much every software component, you know, is different from a different, uh, from any other, you know, software component that we work on. And they all need to coexist, meeting the ISO 2626 requirements for uh, freedom from interference and uh, all the ACLB compliance goals that we need to meet. So in the further, in the next few slides, we will quickly go through the various parts of ISO 26262 and you know, some of the challenges and interesting problems. This is just, uh, I think you're all aware of this. This is a quick uh, snapshot from ISO 2626 to 2018, focusing on port six software development. So it has all these various uh, clauses, starting from requirements to design implementation and various testing and verification. I will just refer to these numbers in the slide so that you get the context of what I'm talking about. Okay. So, the first thing we do is when we started the product, the Qualcomm Automotive Solution was based on certain pre-existing software elements we, had. we didn't have to develop from scratch. Some of you might be up, uh, aware that Qualcomm has a rich history in various other sectors, primarily the mobile world, the 5G, and uh, you know we also have other products. So we didn't have to really start from scratch, uh, but we have to uh, leverage on a product which has nothing to do with automotive or functional safety. So one of the first things we did is we did what's called an impact analysis. We looked at all the existing software and figured out how to make it easily complete. We call it safety software binning. Without going into too many details, we use three, one of the three methods. One is we do something called qualification of software components. So based on a certain criteria and the criteria is primarily these components have been used for a long time and they don't directly impact uh, safety critical modules. So they're not developed just for the safety critical modules. A few examples are the standard LibC libraries, which are part of uh, our compiler. And we also have certain security related software, which is not directly used in safety, but they're used for certain switches between secure to the non-secure one. And so for these components, we use what is called software qualification. This is part of a part eight plus 12 in ISO 26262. This is generally one of the simpler ways to achieve ACL compliance where uh, you would uh, follow one of the four steps required. I won't go too much into detail, but it's more like black box testing and you would achieve ACL compliance. And the second idea we use is ACL decomposition. So here, uh, what we have a set of what we call QM components, quality managed component, and we check, can we keep the component assets at QM, but provide safety mechanisms around it? So typically a ACL B requirement would be split as ACL B of B and ACL QM of B. Uh, so this works well for certain 
mechanisms typically inter-process, inter-processor or inter-chip communication like uh, Ethernet PCA or certain remote procedure calls that we have. This way, we don't have to go and make the original software we had ACL complaint, but provide certain safety mechanisms around it to ensure that we meet all the safety needs. So this is, we said, you know, some of our software components fall into this bill. And the third one, if none of this is possible, is we follow the complete ISO 2626.6, uh, where we go through the all the implementation requirements, design requirements, you know, safety analysis, everything, which is the most complex one and takes a lot of resources. Okay. So the first thing we realized when we started this process is we looked at all the teams and also some third party software. And we found that everybody has a different process, different tools and uh, different coding guidelines to design guidelines. Uh, uh, so everything was different. And we had this major challenge to put it all together in a comprehensive way to create a safety case that would satisfy our safety assessor as well as our customers. So what, some of the key ideas we use here is tailoring. So we had, this is by the way, uh, part of ISO 26262 part two plus six which allows for project specific tailoring as well as you know, component specific tailoring. So for every software component, uh, we have a overall process for the whole Qualcomm automotive software system, but then we work with each of the teams and have a separate tailoring done for each of these components so that we can still meet ACL compliance without changing the way they work a lot. The key here we found is that, you know, detailed documentation of the tailoring uh, when we went through the assessment, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the assessors were fine with using different processes, but as long as it's clearly documented and proven that it will uh, meet the ISO 26262 process for safety. So that is the first thing we did. You know, We looked at all of them, had a gap analysis, and the tailoring for every single component set. The second challenge is different tools. Everybody had different tools, starting from different compilers and uh, different tools for code review to different tools for static analysis, code coverage, uh, everything. So we tried to uh, have most of the teams follow a certain tool, which in this case is mostly Parasoft, but for a few teams which couldn't, then we have to have a separate report which you would integrate. And all the tools used by these various teams, we have around 50 to 60 tools. We have to go through a detailed tool qualification, which is ISO 2626-48, clause 11. Uh, so we first do the tool classification to see what TCL level uh, they fall in. And then we have a Qualcomm defined tool qualification process with the help of our quality team. And we finally produce a detailed qualification report. Uh, so one, one key thing we noticed that this has to be done really very early in the project because during tool qualification, sometimes we found that some of the tools were challenging to qualify and they didn't have the required processes or the test plan, et cetera, and we have to switch tools so that we can actually qualify the tools. Similarly, when we are looking for external tools, we always check if they have ACL certification and some cases they didn't, and we have to buy our own uh, a test suite, etc., so that we can qualify uh, those tools ourselves. But this tool qualification and you know integration of tools by various teams is a very important part that we found when we have to work with multiple teams. And the other impo uh, important part is, uh, especially with our customers, uh, more than the assessors, uh, is like they wanted to make sure the customer requirements are traced to our internal requirements, and then those requirements are traced to the test plans as well as all the implementation metrics like you know static analysis, violations, code coverage, goals, et cetera. And in the safety case, we have to present this to our safety assessor. So even though there are teams use different tools, different processes, as long as we can prove the traceability, every requirement has a test plan and every component has all these metrics and provide it in a single traceability matrix, that went a long way in getting through the safety assessment. Okay. 
So yeah, I think I wanted to kind of quickly, in sort of, before going into all the technical details, talk about some practical challenges that we face working with various teams. Okay, so the first step in um, once we had the initial environment set up, like we talked in the previous slides, worked with all the teams, set up the tailoring, and uh, looked at all the tools, set up the tools. Everybody is good. You know, the next step was. Uh, deriving the software safety requirements for a complex SOC. So we used a tool internally uh, called uh, JAMA for the requirements management. Uh, what we did uh, was we first looked at the hardware architectural metrics. Uh, since our software is very close to the hardware, you know, it's a BSP uh, software, uh, to meet the random hardware metrics, SPFM, uh, LFM, uh, etc. We work closely with the hardware team to figure out what are the software assumptions of use they had. So these are typically, you know, fall into this category of periodic register reads uh, or read after write for a register, self-test libraries that we have to write, uh, and some sophisticated techniques like program flow monitoring. Uh, these are required to ensure that we can meet the hardware metrics. So we first looked at that, and then we derived the first set of requirements. This came directly from our system or hardware team. They had AVO use or assumptions of use, and we mapped them directly to our software safety requirements. And the next one, as I talked a little bit earlier, is based on ACL decomposition. So even though most of our requirements are ACLB or ACLD, we went and looked at each of the requirement, worked with the individual software teams, and check if there is a way to do ACL decomposition so that we don't have to necessarily develop a higher ACLB software. So this led to a, a decomposed requirements uh, to, to be able to develop components at a lower ACL level. So this is the second thing. And what this typically entails is adding safety mechanisms. Uh, this is one of the challenging parts we had. So we had safety mechanisms uh, added at very uh, very interesting points. For example, when we have two processors talking to each other, we had something called a remote procedure call mechanism. We would do a CRC of all the parameters in a remote procedure call and then check it on the other side. Uh, similarly, when uh, we have uh, PCA or Ethernet communication with the other cores, so we have multiple cores, then you know we would apply black channel saving on top of that. Uh, there's multiple other examples, like every image we load has an image integrity check where we add a CRC or a hash to the image and check it. And all of the checks has to be done at a uh, certain higher ACL level, typically ACLB, whereas the actual communication mechanism or the verification mechanism itself can remain at a lower ACL. So this uh, helped us derive the next set of requirements. And then last we also had uh, what we called as a software safety software best practices matrix. So every component will tell what is the list of best practices they have to follow. We had a list of around 12 best practices and they will pick and choose, you know, which best practices are to follow. So these are typically like stack overflow detection, uh, program flow monitoring, uh, watchdog monitoring, logical sequence monitoring, et cetera, and fault and error. So with this, you know, we have derived a complete set of software safety requirements. And uh, the biggest challenge is getting all of these various components to work with each other and the safety mechanisms we have to add uh, on top. Uh, one of the main challenges, or any of the safety mechanism doesn't come for free, you know, uh, and our customers typically push back because it has overhead any kind of CRC uh, addition is reasonably expensive and they, they push back and check can we do it without CRC? And finally, we come to a balance saying, okay, we will not do a CRC of every single byte, but we will do at a certain bytes, but still have enough confidence that we would detect any faults. So, so this is the first step, you know, we derive the software safety requirements. And once the requirements are there, we go into architecture and design. As I talked briefly, we have software running on multiple operating systems in different processes. So we had had a two-pronged uh, strategy on how to approach this. For some of the 
CPUs which are not Qualcomm proprietary CPUs, but uh, more of the industry CPUs like our ARM CPU and we had an ARC based processor, et cetera. We, get, we got third party operating systems and uh, pre-integrated them, a QNX, a Safe Orders, et cetera. Uh, and in some cases it was straightforward because they already had the operating system working on uh, a, the same or similar kind of CPU. But in some cases, they have to custom uh, customize their operating system to our processor. In which case, we gave new requirements, and then we have to work hand in hand with them and look at a lot of details on how they uh, release their software. We look at their uh, requirements. We look at their static analysis code coverage metrics. We look at their design plan and ensure that we can use their software, we can qualify their software to be used in our systems. And in some cases, we had uh, hardware and CPUs. Uh, it's uh, primarily the hexagon processor. You can um, search for it. It's a, a publicly available detail. And for that, you know, it, Qualcomm has to develop its own operating system, which we already had. And then we couldn't find a any third-party operating system which would work on them. So we took the effort to make that operating system uh, and you know some other operating system similar ASIL come. So this was the first step you know, we have to do for uh, one of the challenges we had with this complex issues. And the second challenge is uh, we had the same software which has been used not only in automotive but outside automotive, but also within automotive, we have to use it in various products. We have a whole suite of infotainment products or we call them IVA products in which sometimes there's no functional safety at all. In some cases, there's very minimal functional safety. And we have to use the same software in ADAS where everything uh, is uh, AC company. And the moment we make it safe, there's always a challenge somewhere or other, typically in performance, power, thermal, etc. So, and we can't afford to have a different software for every single use case or a different product. So we had a scalable software solution. I had a slide at the end of the deck. I will, I will leave it to you later to go through what the basic design pattern that we use there. I, I won't spend time on that today, but we had a scalable safety software architecture so that the software component can be easily tuned, uh, typically with the configuration parameters that you can use it as a for safety or without safety, and you can sometimes even switch between. Now I am not using this component, let's say GPU for safety, and uh, then we allow uh, certain mechanisms. And sometimes we say, okay, now it is used for safety. You can't um, allow certain things, and we add some safety mechanisms only when it's used for safety. Uh, so a few examples of that is the hardware features, uh, especially related to power. For ADA systems, we prioritize safety over power, uh, thermal mitigation, etc. So certain features like dynamic clock and voltage scaling, uh, thermal mitigation, when the temperature goes high, you reduce the clocks, uh, low power modes, etc. were disabled for uh, when this, a certain component is used for functional safety. But when the same component is not used, we will allow all these features. And the next set of uh, architectural challenge comes from freedom from interference, or you know, you might have had as a criteria for coexistence. Uh, and we had challenges with both spatial and temporal freedom from interference. Uh, we had a whole set of mixed criticality modules. Uh, within all these various operating systems and various processors. And not only that, the various processors themselves, so we had a hexagon processor, application processor, a safety manager processor, all of them in this whole ecosystem needs to also have freedom from interference. We don't want to have a QM hardware given priority over a ASIL hardware, especially when it's running safety critical use cases. Uh, so we solved, the, solved this with a set of uh, uh, memory management units for spatial FFA. We had a MMU for each of these processors, and then we also had a system level MMU called SMMU uh, to be able to provide spatial FFA across these processors. Uh, and we also used a whole set of scheduling mechanisms 
some of this uh, scheduling mechanisms were inbuilt into the operating system. They were priority based or they had something called adaptive partition scheduling, et cetera. Uh, and some of them, we wrote our own scheduler so that whenever we go into an accelerator, we control uh, what goes into the accelerator, for example, our neural signal processor at a certain priority so that we can achieve temporal. Uh, so this whole architecture can in fact be a complete presentation. I can spend an hour on this, but you know, with the time constraints we have, I just put in the few key points. Uh, I would be very happy later to talk to any of you either in this meeting or later to go into some of these challenges, uh, especially, you know, one of the interesting challenges is safety and security coexistence. Now we have new standard for uh, our uh, uh, existing standards given more importance for uh, cyber security or all probably aware of the 24134. Uh, and so safety and security coexisting has become uh, very interesting now, which is more important safety or security. And there are certain hardware and software designed for security. How do we make those uh, ASLB compliant? So th there are some challenges I can, you know, talk to any of you who are interested offline. But this is a quick summary of, you know, in the part six, class seven, the software architecture and, and design challenges. Okay. Uh, so once we got into the architecture and design and went through its implementation, uh, one of the challenges is pre-integration of third-party software components. As I mentioned, we had third-party operating systems and other third-party software we got. Uh, so these basically f fell into three categories. One is we had third-party CEOC software modules. Uh, you know, these are operating systems like uh, QNX, for example. Uh, they have their software module as a CEOC. They have the safety manual and assumptions of use. And typically, they don't change their software to fit our needs. They just come kind of out of the box. Uh, even though we, we did have a lot of detailed discussions and had to make uh, minor changes to them, predominantly uh, we have to satisfy the requirements by accommodating uh, all of their assumptions. So this is one set of uh, software we had. This needed a detailed analysis of their safety manual, AVOUs, and some of their AVOUs we have to pass it on to our customers so that only they would be able to satisfy. And then there are other third-party CEOC software modules which we they were more willing to uh, customize for us. Uh, so we had a processor called the ARC processor for which uh, there were no good safe operating system. So we selected one, but, but they didn't really have something for this processor, but they worked closely with us. And uh, then they had a customized solution, which kind of meant we have to work closely with them on their development life cycle. And uh, we have to, uh, do a software qualification of their software. So this is like the second category. And then there's a third category, which are typically open source. These are uh, uh, compiler C libraries, certain other libraries, which are QM components. And generally they don't, you know, work with you. It's just available open source, but you can use them. So we then took a certain version of them. We sometimes had to buy test suites from other companies to test them and did uh, what we call as a software qualification, which is in part eight plus two. So these are the three methods we use when we got third party software components uh, based on what they are used for, how long they are used for, whether it's a CEOC or not, we have to follow different strategies to integrate this third party software. Okay, so once we had the architecture design and all the list of components defined, the next thing is on to uh, implementation. But before implementation, uh, we wanted to look at the tool we wanted to use uh, to meet uh, the implementation details uh, that the standard requires. So this primarily we use three things, uh, Mistra C complaints for static analysis, code complexity, because uh, ISO 26262 has a clause uh, which says the complexity of the software should be less, and then code coverage. I will quickly talk about the goals in a couple of slides. But when we are looking for a tool that we would use, uh, we had few uh, criteria. One is, as I said, we had a complex associate. So the tool has to support multiple compilers, multiple operating systems, multiple processors. Um, typically for the static analysis, we found a lot of tools scale well, but for when it comes to code coverage where the 
instrumented code has to run on a certain processor, a lot of tools don't scale. So we are looking for a tool which you know would satisfy all these various uh, environments we have. And then we wanted to make sure that the tool is certified for ACLD software development. On top of that, uh, though a lot of tools were able to find the issues in the code, etc., when we wanted to provide a violation or we say we are not going to be able to fix this issue, uh, we wanted a certain suppression to happen to that. So in Qualcomm, anything we cannot meet, there is a safety board uh, which will review all the violation and it has to happen. And we wanted the tool to integrate with the review mechanism here and to produce statistics which tell there are, uh, for example, uh, 20 misrule rules which are suppressed, and then you click on a link and it tells why, which rules we suppress, why did we suppress, et cetera. Uh, and we also wanted to support uh, desktop and server configurations. The desktop is for individual developers to work with the tools. And then uh, for every release build, we automatically run all the static analysis and code coverage in the background and be able to produce a report in a server. So we wanted to support them. And also the tool has to integrate with the Qualcomm's continuous integration environment. And it will basically block any code being checked in if it cannot meet certain criteria. For example, if we have a new code which doesn't have, which, does, which has MISRA violations, which are not suppressed, then the code won't be allowed to check in. So this uh, tool has to work with the Qualcomm CA environment so that we can get certain check -ins. And also, ideally, we wanted a single tool for both static analysis and code. And for code coverage, it's very similar recommend, as I mentioned, but with the additional challenge that uh, code coverage uh, is the tool has to actually work on the actual software static analysis offline. So we had uh, environments where there are no file systems. And for example, our trust zone and certain other hardware has no file system. And then we have to use trace steady to a lot of back, trace steady to support for that. And for some of the processes, we can't instrument the code and put the software in because with instrumentation, we have code bloat and the hardware couldn't take that uh, code bloat. So we have to run it on simulators and the tool has to be able to support. And also one challenge is we have very Qualcomm specific hardware and software, and we wanted our tool vendor to work closely with us and uh, enhance their tool to make customized solutions. So we had, for example, our hexagon processor. Uh, it is not something for which we had any uh, tool uh, that is widely available, that is available. So we wanted our tool vendor to be able to work uh, closely with us to develop customized solutions for them. So with all these criteria, we chose Parasoft as the preferred tool for both static analysis and code coverage. And as Dave mentioned initially, it has been a good cooperation so far. Uh, not only were the tools able to adapt to what we had, but they provided custom solutions for us to work. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Dave for a quick introduction to Parasoft. Dave. Thank, thank you, Guru. I'll just remind the audience, if you've got questions, you can certainly put them into the Q&A uh, so we can see them once we get to that point. Thank you for a moment to talk about Parasoft and safety critical industries. Uh, for more than 30 years, we've been addressing safety critical in multiple industries. But today we're talking about automotive. And for that, we have a two certified solution for 26262 part six up to ASIL B. This provides static analysis, unit testing, code coverage, and reporting that are required for the same. We're a member of the MISRA committee, which means we're maniacally focused on keeping up to date with the standards as far as static analysis is concerned. This would be for MISRA C, for AutoZAR C++14, for security standards like CERT C and CERT C++, as well as many others. We've got over 4,000 rules in the tool. Um, one of the things that's changing in the environment is how teams are adopting their approach to safety critical testing with a modern development approach. And that means, as Guru pointed out, you know, they wanted to block check-ins when they had certain MISR violations that popped up. That means that you have to do a lot of things well. You have to have a lightweight tool chain that can integrate into the CICD, that supports virtualization, and most importantly, can integrate the testing in a workflow that supports the feature branch development. 
we do all that and more. Um, and then really um, specific to the talk today, uh, we are uniquely positioned to assist Qualcomm clients with the only two certified solution for the Hexagon tool chain. So if you will be adopting some of the Qualcomm technologies that Guru is talking about today uh, and have safety security requirements that you need to be testing, you will probably want to talk to me. It's, um, it's a pretty exciting uh, piece of news that we're sharing here today. Uh, w with that, um, I'll hand it back to you, Guru. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Um, so now going a little bit into detail into what kind of goals we set. Uh, we had this pretty stringent goals for uh, static analysis and code coverage. So all our modules, which are ACL compliant, ACL B or ACL D, uh, we didn't have any ACL A or C. We had only ACL B and ACL D, B as in Bravo, D as in Delta. Uh, all the MISRA mandatory and required rules shall be fixed. Uh, having said that, we did allow tailoring. A team can tailor that they won't follow certain rules, and that would be reviewed by a board and approved. And also, we allowed case by case separations uh, for certain uh, software like operating systems. Um, it was very challenging to fix um, certain rules because the MISRA rules, um, you know, were very too stringent for something at a really low level uh, software that we had. Uh, so we did allow certain tailoring, but outside that, all the MISRA mandatory and required rules have to be fixed. And the code complexity has to be less than 20. In fact, it has to be less than 15. And for 15 to 20, we allow with the approval from our board for all the uh, functions that we have for ACLB and ACLB. And similarly, we mandated code coverage of 100%. Again, there's a caveat to all of this, you know, most of the modules got 100%, but something like operating system, they were at 95, 96. And then we reviewed every line of code, which is not approved. And, and the Parasoft tool does a very good job telling which line is covered, which line is not covered. And they have to get an exception uh, from the safety board on why this can't be covered and why it it's okay for them to be not covered and we will not still violate any safety. Uh, so, as I said, yeah, any exception is reviewed by a safety review board and we can suppress it in the Parasoft tool and when the tool generates a report, it will tell there are this many violations open, but there's also this many which are not fixed, but suppressed. And uh, a check-in was blocked, as I told, if a certain static analysis criteria was not met. And when we went to the safety software assessment, we told them the Parasoft reports for any component they want. And, provided detailed static analysis and port coverage. So yeah, this is just a quick capture on the achievements. So we were able to meet all these goals. We were able to get code coverage for all this complex software, some without a file system, and we need a very custom solution from uh, Parasoft. But we were able to meet code coverage for all those various hardware and software and uh, show, show the proof of that to our safety assessor uh, to get through the assessment. Okay, now after the implementation, you know, so this is the implementation is primarily having those coding guidelines and the code reviews, and, but heavily we leveraged on Parasoft tool uh, to be able to get us the required static analysis metrics and uh, the code coverage for our unit test. And the next one is fault injection testing, you know, uh, for all the right side of the V, the unit testing, integration testing, and testing of the verification of software safety requirement. You know, it's uh, there's nothing very special in safety except for one of the key differences, the fault injection test. So we have to spend uh, quite a bit of time with fault injection testing. Again, it's very complex for us because uh, it's not like we had a single ECU into which you can generate faults easily. You have all these sub-processors and accelerators into which we have to uh, generate faults. Uh, so this basically, we use the software safety requirements as well as our safety analysis, FMEA, FTA, DFA, and as well as the FMEA from our hardware team to decide what are all the various faults and how we would test. And we executed the fault injection testing during various stages, unit testing, integration testing, and software testing. And we had the test coverage to ensure all the requirements are covered and all the faults are covered. 
uh, for the approaches for fault injection testing, as I said, it's a bit challenging. So we use this whole set of uh, various ideas we had or approaches for fault injection testing. One is we sometimes the first one we modified our software to have special APIs to be able to generate faults. For example, we send wrong input parameters or we're able to call a sequence in a wrong way, etc. And some place, some of them we had a fault injection module which will corrupt the incoming data. So we have something which can corrupt camera frames, corrupt the PCIe packets, etc. And then see how our hardware, uh, uh, hardware and software dealt with. And the next one, we actually, we had like a special module which we would use only for fault injection testing. We replaced the actual software module by a, a DUT code, which is modified. So we corrupt internal variables and we corrupt the flow. Uh, and whenever you call an API, it will uh, give a wrong uh, result. And then we would say how we would handle those faults. Also, we have to use quite a bit of uh, debugger assisted fault injection. So this is basically, we would set breakpoints in various places. In some cases, unfortunately, this is the only way. And then when it hits a point, we'll go and change a variable or uh, change a register value and then continue the flow and then see if the fault would be generated and we would be able to uh, and handle those faults. And also we used, uh, in the last point, we used Trace32 extensively. So we would go and connect directly to the hardware and change certain register values or write to a register, for example, to generate an ECC corruption, et cetera, and then do our test. So we had a combination of all these approaches. And as I said, with the complex SOC, we have this various inputs coming in, outputs going out, and internally they talk to each other and we want to introduce faults everywhere and then be able to uh, ensure that uh, the fault is handled properly as expected. One, one of the interesting things with fault injection, previously, you know, when we did our software testing, we mostly kept the testing to within Qualcomm and say, hey, these are our test plan, test results, and any customer can just, you know, come and ask for any test plan to be executed, we'll execute for them to ensure um, it all works. Uh, but with fault injection testing, our customers showed a deep interest in being able to reproduce it themselves, which was kind of a very good, very interesting revelation for us. So we have to, we typically don't expose a lot of these details to our customers on how, what kind of registers we have due to proprietary reasons and how you can corrupt them uh, or give them code, which is on purpose as a fault. But when we got into functional safety, we realized that uh, our customers have to be able to trigger the same fault so that it is handled at their level at a higher application on MC. And since, uh, safety is you know uh, so critical they will basically take all our fault injection testing reproduce it in their environment and make sure they also handle that so we have to not only give detailed documentation on our fault injection testing but also provide them all the scripts which are required the trace that you do access everything so that they pretty much have the same environment as as us to be able to do the fault injection Okay, I think we're almost running out of time. Uh, so we had an external assessment with a company called the Myra and we were uh, assessed uh, uh, for ACLB complaints and some of the uh, uh, Parasoft uh, tool uh, features were very useful, especially to be able to show the suppressed issues and to in a single place be able to show all the static analysis and code coverage results. Okay, this is the last slide. So the key takeaways are for safety software compliance of a complex SOC software, don't jump into implementation or coding right away, but spend a lot of time on the architecture architecture that we need to have. Sometimes I hear, you know, <clears throat> the same impression like safety is about doing what you do, but test it well, you know, fix the all the code issues. But architecture plays a very key part when we want to achieve uh, complaints for SOC software. Uh, so this primarily, and as I talked, adding all the required safety mechanisms, having a safety case to say whatever you're doing is ACLB compliant is very important. Then tool selection plays a very key role. Uh, we have the right tool that goes a long way, not only in being able to meet all of our goals, but to be able to show to the assessor that you know we did meet all the goals. Documentation and proof that we did is, is very important. A project-specific tailoring is is also a key because uh, SOC has 
multiple components which come from everywhere, from within your company, from third party companies, some QM, some ASL, some CEOC. And it's very important to have project specific tailoring. You can't have apply the same scale to all the various software components. And on a similar line, strategy for achieving ACL compliance of pre-existing software has to be defined uh, because it's just practically impossible to rewrite every piece of software you have uh, or write a software from scratch just for ISO 26260 compliance. So you have to be able to use pre-existing software, but use it in a smart way so that you can achieve and prove ACL compliance. Uh, and careful selection and integration of third-party software is required. Most of the software you have is available somewhere, but would it be ACL compliant? Would you be able to prove uh, and integrate it well within your ACLB system is the key then. So we have to have very careful selection and integration of third-party software. And the successful assessment, you know, we had a set of assessment meetings almost over six months to be able to achieve our assessment. And one thing we realized is it's, uh, extremely important to have not only strong evidence, which we had, but strong argumentation. So we have to spend quite a bit of time to provide argumentation in our safety case on why what we are doing makes for a strong safety case. So uh, that is something uh, we have to focus, uh, you know, for a complex association, we have to focus on quite a bit because all these various interactions. With okay, so this is all I had. And uh, thanks a lot for your time. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. That's brilliant. Thank you, Guru, for, for a great presentation there. And thank you, Dave, for your input as well, of course. Um, we do have time for a quick uh, a quick few questions. Um, and I've got one here so lined up and ready for you, Guru. Um, someone's asked, basically, how long did it actually take to get through the external assessment? Uh, do you have any advice you can share on optimizing that process? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so for us, the external assessment took from beginning to end around uh, six months, but I would say the we had a two month stretch, which is kind of the final uh, stretch where you know where the assessor initially gave a certain feedback. We have to go and work on that, and then uh, again go back to them for a further assessment. So the it's a very 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 good question, and the reason we were even though two months or six months looks like a long time, it it is kind of relatively small. I would say you know since the project goes from. Uh, few years. So what we did, even before the external assessment, we had a different uh, consultant due to independence requirements who would basically give us a friendly assessment. You know, So basically, once we did the requirement, we went to our consultant and he would tell us you would pass the assessment only if you did this, this and this changes. And so this is kind of an assessment, but it's you know, uh, it's like a friendly assessment, though they will give us all the feedbacks they call them findings. So they all the findings and some are, you know, uh, not, they call it non-compliant, some are advisory, etc. And then we'd go and fix and again, go back to them. We didn't do it for every single module, but we went, did this for a selective set of modules. And then once we learned that we applied it to all the modules. Similarly, after our architecture and design phase, we did the same. And after our static analysis and code coverage. We did the same. And once the friendly, uh, you know, assessor basically, gave us an approval that it's all good. We then went to a different assessor for the formal assessment. Even with that, you know, one challenge is every assessor has his own way of thinking, or he might pick a different software module to assess. So it's not like one assessor says good and other another still might have it. So we went to a second assessor and he still had quite a few things that uh, we had to provide more evidence and argumentation. So I would uh, really recommend uh, engaging with a safety consultant, if as far as this is the first time we are doing it, especially if it's the first time, uh, who would you know give you feedback and you can fix before you go for a, a, a another assessor who would do the formal assessment. Okay, so it's like getting that kind of two set authentication, I suppose, realistically. Now that's a really interesting point, and I hope that addresses your question there as well. Um, there's actually sort of a, I, I suppose almost a second part to that as well. Someone's asked um, for the Parasoft tools. Um, why is TUV certification important? Um, they've asked, what if I use sort of open source for testing? Dave, you Excellent. Oh, this, is, this is Dave. Maybe I should take it. Yeah, by all means. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it's a great question. Um, and we, Parasoft, get asked this quite frequently, as you can imagine. 
Uh, the major value, quite simply, is time. The second value is capability and the risk that you can't actually perform the testing that's required. You know, as, as Guru just pointed out, you know, one of the things that was really important for the assessor is having strong evidence. And being able to collect that evidence means you have the capability to perform the types of testing and get that data in a useful format that the assessor can see, navigate, understand. Um, you know, for ASOL D, for example, you have to do MCDC coverage and you have to be able to collect that code coverage on target. These are really complex things to do for an embedded system. Um, back to the first part, if you don't use a certified tool and you use open source, you have to qualify that tool. Uh, and it can be costly as far as time and effort is concerned. And for open source, you know, once you've done that, once you've done that qualification, you kind of have to lock that tool down because now you cannot introduce new software changes uh, once you've done that certification. So it kind of limits the value of open source overall for a safety certified project. Um, and then lastly, you know, Parasoft, because we are too certified, we have designed features that are meeting the needs of customers like Qualcomm and many other automotive customers, uh, in particular for meeting the goals of 26260. I think that 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 is all of the all the questions we've got. But for now, thank you so much, Guru and Dave. I don't know if you have any final quick words you'd like to say. Uh, thanks, Josh, for arranging, and thanks for everyone who attended. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you to you both, and of course, thank you to Parasol.